My name is Ed Wasserman. I'm the Dean of the Graduate School of Journalism here, and I'm welcoming you to the uh, seventh annual uh, Logan Investigative Reporting Symposium. Uh, it's a little presumptuous of me to be welcoming you since I just got here myself three months ago, uh, but I think presumptuousness is part of the job description of deans. I'm trying to get the hang of it. Um, the, the School of Journalism here at Berkeley has a very, uh, has a terrific faculty, so we're quite used to having distinguished journalists passing through town, but there really is nothing in the season that compares with the Logan Symposium for the distinction and the accomplishments of the people who come here. It, it really, I, I salute you, uh, this really is for us Oscar night. Uh, we're thinking of adding the crisscrossing searchlights and the red carpet next year, just to, for the finishing touches. And now that's partly a tribute, of course, to uh, Lowell Bergman's hard work and the work of his staff and Lowell's own stature within the profession. And I also want to say it's a tribute, too, uh, to the um, Riva and David Logan Foundation. Uh, in an era when foundation support uh, tends to be brittle and fickle, uh, the Logan Foundation has been steadfast and generous in their support for investigative reporting, for advancing it and defending it. Um, and we are deeply grateful for what they've done in the generosity uh, and the reliable, reliability of their generosity. Uh, and for that reason, it gives me, it's a great pleasure now to introduce to you, uh, since uh, uh, David is gone and Reeve is unable to join us today, I introduce to you uh, Jonathan Logan, president of the foundation, who is going to add his welcome to mine. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning. I'm not really sure which it is. Uh, Ed, it's a pleasure having you uh, join the school. And uh, we're looking forward to your guiding light to uh, take the grad school to great heights, so thank you. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome all of you on behalf of the Reva and David Logan Foundation to the seventh annual symposium. Seven, I you know, didn't really realize we were, we were that old already. Our family foundation is represented here today by my brothers Dan and Richard. Raise your hands. Oh, there you go. And me. Uh, and has been and will continue to be active in funding investigative journalism. Our commitment was born out of our father's interest in journalism. David Logan, who passed two and a half years ago, stressed the importance of investigative reporting and its place in sustaining a healthy democracy. Investigative reporting organizations, while struggling still to develop sustainable models, um, are really doing wonderful things, successfully collaborating to produce high quality, in-depth investigative reporting, and reach large audiences by delivering stories on multiple platforms, allowing people to get the news in the way that it works for them. It's, uh, it's really gratifying to see this happening. We are keenly aware of the importance that foundations play in bolstering investigative reporting. When foundations and individual donors take risks that encourage creativity and entrepreneurship, we know we may come up with nothing, like investigative uh, reporting sometimes comes up with nothing. But uh, we also know that this new baby, new, new journalism or the reinvented journalism, uh, is in a great place to stand up and create the needed tools to bring investigative reporting to new heights. IRP, under the, the great Lowell Bergman, uh, the Center for Investigative Reporting and ProPublica are, are just a part of the many groups that are doing really great things to reinvent journalism. Y'all, 
are the cutting edge of innovation in investigative reporting. And it is such a pleasure every year to see more and more of you and uh, to hear about the new things happening. So the thing about you guys that I know for sure is that you understand that injustice will not reveal itself. So, big round of applause. <laughs> It's now my privilege to introduce to you a man who has dedicated his life to uncovering injustice and abuse of power, and now shares his vast knowledge and many connections to train new generations of investigative reporters to tell the stories that make a difference. An extraordinary, and I mean extraordinary, shift disturber, the Reven David Logan Distinguished Professor Lowell Bergman. Well, thank you, Ed and John. Um, by the way, uh, the David Logan, who passed away uh, after he um, uh, sent 15 shares of Berkshire Hathaway and endorsed in the university to create an endowment for an investigative reporting chair. And I called him up. I said, well, what am I supposed to do with this? And he said, make trouble, which leads me to uh, what I was thinking about as, the, as this uh, symposium was, uh, date was coming, which is that I've been in this business uh, for over 45 years. Um, and I realized that uh, I am on Social Security at the same time that I'm getting my salary here at the university. Um, and so that, that entitles me to do some reflection and so uh, I'm announcing, John, a new program here in geriatrics and investigative reporting. <laughs> um, but uh, the other thing I'd like to do is thank uh, uh, Mother Nature, because for the seventh year in a row, we have no rain, and we will be able to eat outside tonight. Um, uh, some extraordinary luck. Uh, you know, this gathering now, uh, today, we have people from Germany, people from Canada here. We have people from Argentina and China. Um, so people from all over the world and almost every part of the country. Uh, and uh, it gives me great pride that we've been able to bring together these people. But again, it would only have been possible with the work of the people who've helped you get here, who sent you the invitations, and I know I've announced them a couple of times already yesterday, but again, Alicia Klatt, Marlena Telvik, um, Alicia Jaffer, Nadine Dubron, uh, and Tim McGurk, the five of them who just kept working constantly to make this all happen. Um, okay, so, uh, and because I'm, I'm reaching, I'm closer to the end than the beginning, uh, I think it, I, in my reflections, I also thought it was important uh, to talk, A, a little bit about what the program has become over the last eight years. Uh, this program is now the largest investigative reporting program in both, let's say, dollar figures. It's 90% supported by donations, grants, and gifts uh, at any university, I, as I can tell, in the world. Uh, we now have five uh, staff people who do teaching and reporting at the same time. Uh, we've been now teaching more classes, uh, and we hope to be expanding. And with the help of particularly a frontline and now a, a beginning collaboration with uh, Univision, we're hoping to do more documentary production in the years to come. And so uh, it's, be it's becoming what I uh, hope most journalism schools, and this journalism school included, will become which is a new kind of outlet or a platform for presenting in-depth reporting um, as a news outlet in itself and producer. Um, it, it, we couldn't, I wouldn't be here today, I realized, it's reflecting on, it, on the 45 years of reporting without the support of many of the people here in the audience. 
So I wanted to, and this goes back a long way, because if you've, you've got a program, right, and in the program, I know you normally probably don't read the remarks and so on in the introduction, but you'll, you might reflect that I noted that at one point I was known as the Lenny Bruce of libel. Uh, this had to do with the number of libel suits that were pending, plus the total damages being asked at the same time. And that was 38 years ago. And 38 years ago, uh, and in the decade after that, for a period of 10 years, all this litigation was going on. And you know, when you get in the troublemaking business, you also get in trouble. And when, one of the things that you notice right away who, who, is who calls you up and asks how can they help, and who doesn't talk to you anymore. It's a, it really, it's a, it's an immediate thing. You can, all of a sudden you can figure out who's really there and who isn't. And there's someone here today, for instance, who was there immediately. He had no real reason to say, you'll be okay, don't worry, we're here, we'll do something for you. He just heard about the travails that I was enduring here in Berkeley. And so he put up his hand, and anytime I saw him, I always got a smile and I knew I'd get some help. And he's here today. He's the former dean of the journalism school, Ben Bagdikian. Ben. I don't know. Anyway. And there are quite a few others here. By the way, all my, almost all my pro bono lawyers are here <laughs> over the years. In fact, one of the first, Stan Pottinger, who you'll be hearing from uh, uh, in a little while, uh, came forward at one point to assist in a matter which will be the subject of something I talk about in the, on the panel on the consequences of investigative reporting. But in addition to Stan, there's Lee Levine is here. Put your hand up, Lee. G Gary Bostwick, who uh, Celeste Phillips couldn't be here today, and uh, Tom Leatherberry, what I always like to say from Dallas and Vincent and Elkins, who would have thought. Uh, so. Uh, I don't, I travel with, by the way, with, uh, those are my bodyguards, really. In the, and, and another person who's here is another former dean, uh, Tom Goldstein. And Tom uh, not only came to my assistance when he was the dean at Columbia, uh, but more recently he and Rob Gunnison, who may be here somewhere, uh, retired as the, as the um, sort of uh, Tom's number two, uh, um, arranged for the, for the funding of the building that we're in and the fact that the university, and that we are now not only technically part of the university, but physically part of the university. So thank you, Tom. Um, let me see. Okay, and then there's somebody in the audience who got me in a lot of trouble, or helped get me in trouble. Jeffrey Wygand is here. He's sitting right over there, uh, who you may recall. You guys all think it's that I, that I was, oh, Celeste is here. <laughs> Another lawyer. <laughs> uh, I guess they, they are all wondering what I'm going to say and, and what they're going to have to do about it later. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, the, by the way, the reason I was so attracted to Jeffrey Wigand wasn't because of what he knew about tobacco. Um, what, the reason I was interested in, Jeff, in Jeffrey Wigand is that in my career, I had gotten various mafia people to talk, to go public. Um, I'd gotten um, CIA people to talk. But I realized that no one in the business had ever gotten a fiduciary officer of a Fortune 500 company to talk out of school. And, um, and obviously that was the experience, and if you've seen the film The Insider, that was the experience, the legal question that was used to suppress the story. Um, Jack Palladino was here yesterday. I guess he's not here today. Anyway, he was, our, he was my pro bono private investigator in some of these travails. Um, and then uh, there are a number of people here from 60 Minutes, but one in particular I've got to point out uh, Debbie DeLuca Shea. Is she here? Yeah, right here. Oh, she's over there. Okay. So Debbie and I worked together at, uh, at 60 Minutes. She was my colleague on the tobacco story. Uh, she's gone on um, to become a, what I would call a manager of 60 Minutes. Um, 
and, and, and it didn't seem to damage her career. I think in part because now Jeff Fager, who's the chairman of CBS News, was uh, during that period of time the only executive in, at the uh, company that I could trust. Um, and uh, some of you met him in the past. And then uh, before I go on to a couple of other rem uh, remarks uh, about someone else, who, uh, well, there's, there's a couple of more people. Uh, one of the other pe persons who stood up, stood up publicly, stood up to a public assault by Don Hewitt and Mike Wallace at an event in, in 2000 in the wake of all the tobacco incidents and also the film is David Fanning, who is right there. Okay. Um, <laughs> wait. Lesson number one is always have good pro bono lawyers. Lesson number two when you get in trouble is have an employer. Or <laughs> 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 set up in advance, by the way. Um, and then someone many of you have not heard of, uh, when I first went from print to TV in early, in early 1978, I was extremely worried that by going from print and into TV, I was going into an, a medium what, which, while it paid more, might get me in the kind of trouble that I didn't want to get into, which was possibly doing stories I didn't want to do, sensationalizing stories, getting me on, on an assignment that in some way would reflect negatively on my journalistic credibility. Uh, and I looked around for examples, and one of those examples uh, that I could follow is here today. He's the guy who I found out decided when he was at CBS News that he, could, he thought he could get away with doing an investigation of bribery and payoffs by CBS Records. This is an early 1970s event. Um, and it resulted in this then young producer uh, leaving the network. They didn't completely kill the story. They were much smarter then in network television. They ran it at a, at a very early hour on a Sunday. Um, and then he departed after. And his name is Stan Hope Gould. And he's sitting over here. And I found out he lives locally. <laughs> And I think anybody who knows anything about the television news business that Stan probably rivals me in creating trouble in his career. Um, so this, let me, let me say a couple of words right now about what we're going to, the panel that we're going to have and um, uh, the issues we're going to talk about. And it's, it's one of the reasons that I asked Stan Pottinger to come here because he has a unique experience going back uh, almost 40 years, um, when he was a, a lead prosecutor for the Justice Department uh, and conducting a, a grand jury and doing a number of other things related to activities by the U.S. government uh, that turned out in the end to be illegal. Um, and, you know, um, the issue of sources, the issue of keeping your word, the issue of, of maintaining ethical standards, and this is a slight digression, makes me remember and, and want to thank someone who couldn't be here today. One of our donors um, uh, who puts up the money that we match for the fellows uh, is, was a woman named Marion Sandler. Now, you may have read some things in, in obituaries and elsewhere about Marion's passing, but let me tell you that Marion Sandler was one of the most ethical, strict, tough business people I'd ever met. And I think that people should remember um, in, in thinking about the program, that our program in, uh, in essence is inspired by people like her and her legacy. And the issues that the, of, of, for example, protecting sources is a critical issue that I think you, we need to line up both our donors, whether they're foundations or individuals, with us in an attempt to defend our sources and appreciate them. Uh, and by appreciation, I'm, I'm thinking more directly about some, um, someone whose name all of us know, but very few of us have done anything about and maybe digress for a second there. You, when we think about leaks of confidential and national security information, we think about, let's say, Daniel Ellsberg and the Pentagon Papers. 
and he was prosecuted by the Nixon administration. Well, Daniel Ellsberg, who had leaked all those documents, never spent a night in jail. He was indicted, he was arrested, he was booked, but he was released. Today, there is a former private in the U.S. Army who is still incarcerated, who has now accepted in a plea a 20-year sentence, and they're continuing to prosecute. He's our source. He's my source. He's many of your sources. You still go to WikiLeaks and look at the documents. You still put those documents into your stories. Yet so far, our, our news media in general has basically ignored the story or in some way found some reason to criticize the way in which he's gone about providing us with that information. We've done the same thing actually to Julian Assange, who was the intermediary who brought us those documents. And I would suggest that this kind of behavior is not going to uh, encourage people who have something to say, who want to reveal some information to come forward and tell us. So when we reflect about this panel and the discussion we're about to have, yes, sources are difficult because they're just like us. Reporters are not necessarily the easiest people to deal with. And sources have their own agendas. But sources are what we depend on, along with their documents. And it's really important for us to remember that when we think of reasons why they may not be credible or whatever we assume their motives may have been.